Hey, what's up? It's me, your favorite sh internet roommate. One of the things I've noticed in recent years is sort of this reappreciation for older graphics. Lately, I've been seeing a lot of love for that whole like low poly, you know, like Nintendo 64, PS1, and even PS2 uh, aesthetic. Look at this digital art done by Jack MCV. He uses Blender to take this scene from the 90s film uh, Fallen Angels and turns it into a low poly PS1 render. This goes stupid hard for no reason. Just, just look at this. Another artist doing similar work is Vic Estrella. What he focuses on specifically are parts of Mexico and Mexican culture, and once again, turns them into a PS1 render using Blender. And again, this what? goes stupid hard. Point is, it got me all reminiscent and thinking about older video game aesthetics and why they're so memorable and loved even years later. Nostalgia definitely plays a part in that. Like, you play that Budokai 3 opening in front of me too many times, like, once. Um, I'll cry. I'll what? do it. Don't test me. I'm a bitch. I wrote that in that script exactly how it was before Toriyama's passing. I didn't even understand the weight of what I was saying. We're gonna do a Dragon Ball video probably after this one. Just just wanted to let y'all know. Ah, oh, damn. Whether you're talking about the beautiful pixel art of Chrono Trigger or the gorgeous cell shading nightlife of Jet Set Radio, or the foggy, low-poly horror of Silent Hill. Every gamer sees a different era's aesthetics as home. Because yes, it is hard to tell if that is actually Keanu Reeves' beautiful face or just a video game, and there's probably a mole on Arthur's butt that has more pixels than the entirety of Ocarina of Time. But still, there's just something special about this. While I do think it's impressive to look how far graphics have evolved over the years, I want to talk about what these older game aesthetics bring to the table and just appreciate them. You know, just give them a nice little scruff on the head and then maybe look at newer games that took that same style but gave it a fresh new cut. You know, like you look at it and you just can't help but go like, Mmm! I like it, cut, G. That looks good. If any of that at all sounds remotely interesting to you, then please hop into this time vortex with me as we begin our journey with... Whee! My bad, y'all. Sometimes these time vortexes can get backed up, so I'll just be uh, floating here for a little bit. Damn, I'm hungry. Can't even go to like the grocery store or anything. Oh, but lucky for me, my factor order can send me fresh, never frozen, chef-crafted meals, even in a time vortex. For me, what I really appreciate about Factor is I struggle these days with knowing what exactly a healthy meal even is. Social media got me thinking cold water is fattening at this point. But with Factor, I don't even have to think about that. Because they'll send you meals that are dietitian approved, calorie smart, protein smart, and even vegan options. They remove all that time and hassle of finding a healthy recipe, going to the grocery store, prepping ingredients. All of that is taken care of by Factor and sent to your door, or in my case, a uh, time vortex. And the best part is a lot of their meals can be ready to eat in just two minutes. So I can make my whole meal in this time vortex and start eating it before I even got to start the next part of this video. So if you're struggling with time management, eating healthier, even saving money because uh, <clears throat> uh, grocery price is kind of crazy right now, Factor can help with all three. So why not get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders? Using my link, click the link in the description or scan the QR code with your phone. And now while I'm still here, I'm going to finish this meal and we can get back to the video. This is the most obvious place to start as it's 
kind of the genesis of gaming aesthetics, and it's probably the most nostalgic to me. I mean, just look at my PFP, look at what you get when you're at my highest tier on Patreon. Uh, <clears throat> you, you can totally join too if you want one. <clears throat> cough, cough. <clears throat> uh, this is just home to me. So naturally, it just has this innate feeling of comfy nostalgia built into the colors and shapes and textures. And while it is a style that is far more simple, I think that not only allows it to have this innate charm, but I also think it allows it all to stay in our minds so much more clearly. Because with pixel art, you kind of have to make a representational depiction of something versus a one-to-one -one depiction of it. They can only really show the most recognizable parts of whatever they're depicting. From there, it's all about the creativity of the color usage or the textures. One of the things that immediately comes to mind when I think of peak pixel art, especially in that SNES era, is all the gorgeous ass JRPGs. God, the backgrounds, the colors, the overworlds. I remember being able to like fly around these overworlds and thinking it was like the most amazing invention ever. <laughs> all the great character sprites that at times have the most charming ass animations. I can't help but have a smile on my face every time I see the Chrono Trigger like celebration animations. Look at that shit. I love it. And whenever they make a character sprite that was a lot bigger to like, you know, depict a boss or a, a god character that you always fight at the end of JRPGs, that's where the coolest artistry is because you get to see them just pack these sprites with so much detail. It's like, look at this shit. You can't tell me that shit isn't cool. You got Trials of Mana, which is just the perfect depiction of like a fantasy world in pixel art. Rustic villages, beautiful bright skies, and there's just something about forests in pixel art. I, I just, it's my favorite way to depict a forest in video games. Look at the way the roots of this grand elder tree just dig deep under the water, and then you got these beautiful little lily pads just floating here. Oh my god, this place is this place is stunning. Oh, and I've always found waterfalls to be like particularly special looking when done in pixel art, especially like in this case where you can like just have your character run underneath it. I don't know, I, I just fuck with it. <laughs> you also have the original Star Ocean, which usually goes for a more moody color palette, still colorful, but not as vibrant. If Trials color palette was like the original gummy worms, this one is like the wild berry flavor gummy worms. But regardless, it makes, again, for some gorgeous ass environments. Look at this gorgeous autumn looking red forest. Look at this hilltop shot. Like, are you seeing that skybox with that sunlight just beaming through those blue clouds? Oh man. Look at the way that the clouds that you don't see are reflected into the puddles of this area. But the peak of Star Ocean's aesthetics have to be in snow areas. That moody, berry-flavored gummy worms color palette just beautifully lends itself to this weather. And of course, you can't talk pixel art and JRPGs without talking about Chrono Trigger. The range of types of beautiful pixel art you can get in this game is insane. Because of that time travel mechanic, you get to see all these beautiful overworlds and environments from all these different time periods. Medieval fantasy lands with villages and beautiful lush forests. Grand castles that have trial rooms that look like this. Look at the scale, look at the colors, look at the stained glass window. But you also get the rainy, dinosaur-filled jungles of the past and the bleak, barren, dystopian sci-fi future. You get it all here, and it looks beautiful. And don't even get me started on the island of Zeal. I will never forget seeing this for the first time. It would begin my obsession with floating green, like, castle environments. <laughs> and the way that the waterfalls just fell down almost eternally just into the atmosphere, who, whose ever idea that was? J Another thing I always appreciated during the pixel art era were the backgrounds of pretty much any fighting game. Like look at Suzaku Castle from Street Fighter. Nothing beats that orange skybox with those clouds and the sun setting. But there's so many more. Like let me let me let me show you. <laughs> Then you got this castle area with this beautiful brick architecture. Look at those angel statues with these birds just chilling here. And it's got moss growing on the statue, which you know always gets my willy going silly. Not to mention the scenery in the background with those beautiful mountains, that blue twinkling water, and that gorgeous 
or a boreal ass? But wait, there's even more. Then you got these ruins with that beautiful background, that beautiful sky, and just, just look at the statue. Just chilling in the background of where you're fighting at. But it wasn't just Street Fighter. Mortal Kombat also had some really cool backgrounds, but instead of like making me awe at their beauty, they kind of scared the shit out of me as a kid. With this really weird palace area with these moving clouds and this random ass wizard just kind of floating there. Part of the look here came from the team actually experimenting with digital graphics. They had footage of real stunt people and even real background elements and digitized them down to pixels, which is a big part of why these games have that semi real look to them that's kind of uncanny and a little spooky. Like this tree area that always gave me nightmares because like, I mean, just look at how spooky the trees are and also the way their mouths open, like... And in the 90s is where you start to see them kind of experiment with what they can do with pixel art. Donkey Kong Country is an obvious example of this, kind of taking pixel art and kind of mixing it with pre-rendered 3D graphics. Or the way they mix pixel art with hand drawing to create what is probably the most beautiful game of this era with Yoshi's Island. Everything about this game just makes me feel so comfy. The warm, vibrant colors or the way like the clouds or objects in the background just slightly move. Mixing these styles basically made this timeless style that looks like a sketchbook come to life that you could just run around and roam in. And this marriage of hand-drawn with pixel art has kind of been an evolution of pixel art altogether. Like I almost had an entire section just talking about beautiful hand-drawn looking games, but I didn't want this video to be any longer than it probably will be. <laughs> you see it with things like Golden Sun having these pixel art characters kind of running around a hand-drawn world. And it was already beautiful here in the 90s, but when you look at how hand-drawn aesthetics with pixel art has like evolved in recent years with indie games, Hollow Knight is an amazing example of this. There are so many beautiful locales in this little bug world that feels very inspired by Angel's Egg. Like I'm never gonna forget that first time I came to the City of Tears with that beautiful music and just the, the rain-drenched Victorian architecture, like, it's an amazing example of graphics that some would deem older looking, but really it's just timeless hand-drawn beauty. Same could be said for how it was used in Nine Souls, or how it was used in Cuphead to deliver on that rubber goose, you know, old Disney aesthetic. Check out how Pokemon Mystery Dungeon had this pixel art aesthetic, and when they remade it, instead of doing, you know, whatever the fuck this is, they went for a more hand-drawn style that kind of mimics those uh, little illustrations that you would see in the original game, which is, that's just, that, yeah, that's awesome. In fact, the Pokemon series is actually a great example of what I'm talking about here. Growing up with the Pokemon series, one of the coolest things to see was how Game Freak slowly masters the look of pixel art through gens 1 through 5. Y'all know I could talk all day about that snowing volcanic ash route, or the desert route with the sandstorm, or the rainforest route with the overgrown grass and the constant rain, the comfy, colorful flowers in Floroma Town, or a turn of forest with like the shade of the trees and the, the music and like the, the, the old chateau. But I remember distinctively the first time I played Gen 5. I was blown away at how far the pixel art had come, and there were so many beautiful locations. And the way how the game had different seasons that would change the aesthetic of the locations you were in. But I would say the biggest change was the sprites of the Pokemon themselves. The Pokemon would actually move, and while yes it's a small change, but I think it adds so much to the game and really elevates it. At this point, all I could think was that Pokemon had mastered pixel art and it could only go up from here. Right? The Pokemon games are a perfect example of how having more graphics doesn't necessarily mean a better aesthetic. I still think Pokemon has yet to make a game that is visually pleasing as these games. Because when they did move to 3D, I just don't think they've really found an identity in that field. Don't even get me started on how some of these 3D models have just, just butchered my boys. Like, 
Not to say that 3D graphics in general are bad, plenty of games have made that transition much more smoothly, like the Mario series or the Zelda series. But with Pokemon, it just feels more at home with pixel art, and I feel they could have just kept elevating that look. Instead, I feel like they saw 3D as like this necessary step to evolution, and that pixel art was old, which as you've seen is just not the case. A lot of these pixel art games from these eras have aged far more gracefully than their 3D counterparts from around the time. Pixel art as an aesthetic is timeless. Much like how just because we have paintings that can capture the exact reality of a subject, that doesn't mean that now more impressionistic style paintings are somehow outdated. In a lot of ways, you can compare pixel art to something like impressionism, or probably something more like pointillism, which are paintings that use individual dots to create an approximation of something. I think this is why indie games that have to use these styles because they have a much smaller team continue to thrive and are wildly loved for their visuals. Like these games are some of the most loved games of the last like 10 years. And because they're using modern tech to make these pixel art games, it allows them to make these games a lot easier than it would have took back in the day. But also, pixel art has never looked better. Have y'all seen Octopath Traveler 1 and 2? These games are such beautiful examples of modern pixel art. Could you imagine if we were in a timeline where instead of Pokemon moving to, again, whatever the fuck this is, instead they stuck with pixel art as an aesthetic and now we would have Pokemon games that look like this? Whatever timeline that is, they're probably doing a lot better than us because they didn't have to hear me yap for an hour about regions. Hyper Light Drifter is another great example of games that just nail the usage of pixel art to deliver on an aesthetic. I remember being awed the first time I saw this landscape with the beautiful pink sky and the city in the distance. Oh my god, look at that shit. Oh. Or whenever you see those awe-inspiring shots of the decaying titans just chilling in the background, Celeste would beautifully merge hand drawing with pixel art to create some of the most gorgeous skyboxes in any pixel art game. Like are you seeing this beautiful mix of pink and yellow in this skybox here? Again, look at that Aurora Borealis. I th I th Wow. Blasphemous uses pixel art to create this realistic, dark, religious imagery. Wicked dead trees everywhere, decaying architecture and statues, lots of moody yellows and oranges. Everything kind of looks like an old, dark, religious painting. And I love the look of Dark Souls, but I've always wanted someone to make like a mod or something of like the entire Dark Souls game, but just in pixel art. But I pretty much get that here with blasphemous. Point is, there's still plenty of amazing examples of how pixel art continues to live and thrive to this day. And I think as games continue to reach higher highs with pure realism, there's always going to be a place for these pixel art games to give you a refreshing alternative. Pixel art has shown to stand the test of time, and I think is proved itself to be far more than just nostalgia, but an aesthetic all to its own. But now it's time to move to something uh, far more triangular. <laughs> I don't really give a shit about labels. I'm just calling this low poly because I, I don't really know what else to call it. Basically that era of games from like the Nintendo 64, PS1, PS2. The just trying shit in 3D era where they were just obsessed with this shit to the point where, you know, you open up Mario 64 and the menu is just Mario's 3D ass face that you could just, you know, fuck with and, 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 and mess with and, you know, just kind of make it look all silly and whatnot. What I find interesting about these visuals is that, you know, in an objective sense, this obviously hasn't aged as gracefully as something like pixel art. But mainly because a lot of these games were attempting to match reality, and uh, well, <laughs> what the fuck happened to Hagrid? <laughs> but as you saw with those artists that I talked about at the beginning of the video, there is an affinity 
for this aesthetic. Part of that obviously comes from nostalgia, but I do think there is something to this aesthetic that it makes it so impactful to people. While yes, a lot of these developers probably were trying to make this look as close to real life as possible, I think in a kind of death of the author sense, because of the limitations at the time, because you couldn't just so easily make something, you know, look realistic, it inadvertently did create a unique aesthetic. Which admittedly is kind of funny, you know, to be looking at like a polygonal fuzzy sunset, an ocarina of time, and still just being like, Man. Are you seeing that? This era's aesthetic skyboxes, they just, they always stuck with me for some reason. It's, it's like this weird mixture of like, it's like, it's beautiful, right? But it also, it has this like weird trippy vibe to it. Let me let me let me lay down right here. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me see. I feel like Spyro was just a goat when it came to this. Like, look at that mix of like a kind of sunset looking pink and orange sky underneath the clouds, and then above is like space with the stars and the black and the purple. Look at that eclipse over there, and the way there's just this orange purplish sky and just all the like yellow around the eclipse and like the clouds oh my what look how heavenly that looks the way that warm orange sun is just bursting out of these white and blue clouds i'm not even sure if i want kids but i would definitely like paint that on like my kid's ceiling if i had one i don't know if that's something like a good parent would do or like if a kid would like it but i hope so when it comes to the spyro skyboxes i could just talk about them all day. Somehow they took these low polygon graphics and were able to make these just like impressionistic dreamscapes out of them. Wow. Because they really lean into the artistry, I think this shit is timeless. I always love like the autumn feel in this area in Banjo and Kazooie. Just look at that beautiful orange and yellow gradient and then the giant trees. Or this sunset in Rusty Bucket Bay. The purple at the top, the water in the distance, the yellow and orange, just a little hint of clouds, and just that sun. Like I look at this and all I could think is we gonna be okay. We gonna be okay. We gonna be okay! Yo, this level in Pokemon Snap had like my favorite skybox. You got that rainbowish iridescent colored sea, and then the stars in the sky with constellations of Pokemon? That shit was genius. Like you got that Mewtwo over there, the the Kingler, the the the, the Pinsir, uh, there's a Doug Trio over there. And oh, oh, coughing, coughing. Oh, and the Mario 64 skyboxes, they were always a standout for me. Again, because there's a lot of unintentionality going on with a lot of the look of these games, all their aesthetics are in this flux state of trying to be reality, but they can't. So what you get is a lot of surreality. That's why there's this weird, unintentional creepiness and unsettling nature to a lot of these games, but especially Mario 64. I've seen so many people talk about how like creepy this game is and it makes them feel all weird, which is usually not normal for Mario, you know? No other Mario game has that weird creepiness to it except in this one. So many of the Mario 64 levels have this unsettling liminal space vibe. And a lot of that is because of this era's aesthetics, but especially the skyboxes. They create this juxtaposition between the levels and the skyboxes. Cause like, look, this is Big Boo's haunt, right? It's like a, your standard Mario 64 level. It's a little spooky, but you know, it looks like a Mario 64 level. But then look at the skybox for the level. Like where the fuck are we? With those black creepy trees, the realistic ass moon in the background. I like, I am freaked the fuck out. And you can say that about pretty much any of the skyboxes in Mario 64. Especially the one for Wet Dry World with this abandoned underwater city with like the sun just beaming through. Like, what the fuck is that? There's a reason there's so many like weird creepy pastas about just this skybox alone, you know? Look at this picture I took of Milo. Isn't he fucking adorable here? Look at him! 
got those fucking shotgun barrels, fucking nostrils, and oh shit! I think one of the clearest examples of this lower poly aesthetic adding to the horror and making things actually more scary is with Dead Hand. In the original Ocarina of Time, Dead Hand, that's a fucking nightmare. That is nightmare fuel. You want that shit far away from you. But then in the 3D remake for the 3DS, Aw, he's kinda cute. Now I'm not just mentioning this aesthetics like innate unsettlingness just to point out like, hey, it's kinda quirky how this looks kinda, you know, a little scary. I'm mentioning it because it makes for the perfect home for horror games. When I think of the most iconic, classic, actually terrifying uh, horror games, games from this PS1, PS2 era always come to my head, with the obvious examples being Resident Evil and Silent Hill. And I know there's remakes coming and there's already been remakes, but there was something about them being in this style originally that I think added to the horror that I don't think can be captured even if maybe it now can be more realistic. Partly that comes from you not being able to fully register what you're seeing because it's not completely lifelike, so your mind has that ability to like fill in the blanks and kind of add to the horror in that sense. But I also think innately this low poly aesthetic does look very fucking uncanny. So putting a horror game in that aesthetic leans into it. Basically because these games were made with those limitations in mind, it added to the ambiguity, it added to the horror, and it added to the atmosphere. For example, these systems had a very short depth of field. From what my dumb brain understands is they don't have enough processing power to like load up everything that should be in front of you pretty quickly. But a lot of these horror games use that as a strength. Silent Hill is the most obvious example of this. Adding this huge fog all in front of you not only adds to the horror because a monster will just like pop out of that fog and that's fucking scary. You never know what's coming in front of you. But also they weave that into the narrative of the game and thus now it's not just a fog that's there for limitations, it's a fog that's there to add to the world of Silent Hill. But even games that didn't have the fog, that just kind of leaned into the fact that, hey, we can't show that much in front of you, that only adds to the horror because it's so dark that the only thing you can see is what's right in front of you and everything else is just this pitch black void. So when something comes out of there, you're not expect- OH SHIT! And you'll see this idea of using these limitations as a strength in horror indie games. There's a lot of these games that purposely choose to use this low poly aesthetic and not just because maybe it's easier for a smaller group or even one person to develop in that style, but because they know if they lean into it, it can add so much to the horror. Akamundo is a great example of this, only having this little lighter to like light your way and everything in front of you is darkness, making every moment feel more claustrophobic and more scary. But also a big limitation of this low poly aesthetic was how oftentimes the textures and even the models at times had this weird like warping effect. Like you see over here as I'm moving forward, the like, texture just does this weird effect. That makes the world of this game so much more uncanny and trippy. Another game that uses this aesthetic and leans into it really well is Sanguine Sanctum. I think this game perfectly understands and exemplifies the weird uncanniness of this aesthetic and leans into it. There's parts of this game that make me feel like I'm in the eclipse from Berserk or like a world that was like destroyed by that eclipse. Nothing in this world makes sense. Like look at all those fucking floating rectangles up there. Like what the fuck is going on? Where the fuck am I? But it's not just these horror indie games that have adopted this style and used it gracefully, but you can also see the love for this aesthetic reflected in D-makes. For those who don't know, a D-make is the opposite of a remake, taking a game that is probably more newer looking and then devolving it in a sense to an older aesthetic or style. Like I love Bloodborne, I think it's a beautiful game, but seeing it in this PS1 style through the D-make did so much for me. And going back to how this low poly aesthetic really does add a lot to horror, uh, there's moments in this D-make that I think are far more scary in the D-make than the original. Like that opening scene where those little creepy baby dudes like crawl on top of you, in the, in the original it's scary. In the D-make, 
And kind of a side note, but it comes up in the demake. One of the things that I loved about this era of aesthetics was the menus. <laughs> surprise, surprise, I like random, unnecessary, not really important, cool things in video games. It's me. But I always loved how a lot of these games had these menus where when you clicked on an item, it showed you like this entire 3D uh, render of the item and it would like spin around and shit. No fucking clue why I fucked with it. But I fucked with it. And they have that kind of menu in the D make, and I, I just think that's really cool. And because I can't put it in better words, let me show you a clip of the creator of the Bloodborne D make where she talks about like why she did this and why she thinks they're cool. <laughs> Earlier I mentioned replicating sensibilities of games made during the PS1 era, because it's not just the hardware, it's the mindset of culture, right? If if you gave a modern developer a development kit for a PlayStation 1 game and told them to make an indie game with it, and it was authentically a PS1 game, it would be fundamentally different from a PS1 game. You'd throw it into the library of PS1 games, it would stand out. The biggest example of that is the like, holy shit, we're in 3D now mindset, where every game would just shove a big 3D object in your face and like rotate it around super slowly. Every game did that and it was great, I loved it. Tomb Raider was a big inspiration, specifically like the radial wheel of the 3D objects. That was definitely Tomb Raider inspired. That stopped as we got used to 3D. It wasn't, it wasn't eye popping anymore. It was great bringing that back. And those are kind of like the most important things about why this aesthetic is cool. But now, because I'm a shitty writer, that's why I'm a YouTuber. So I'm gonna just throw this section in where I just kind of like point at things and be like, hey, that's cool. Isn't that cool? I think that's cool. I don't know what it was, but there was something special about snow levels, especially on the N64. Something about snow in this low poly aesthetic just, just makes for the perfect marriage. And it might sound funny coming from like a, a, someone who grew up Muslim, but like this, this is Christmas. You know, like, like this personifies Christmas. So I don't know. I, I fuck with it. <laughs> the comfiness is just unmatched. Another aspect I don't think gets enough love is pre-rendered backgrounds. There is something about the artistry on a lot of these, especially in Final Fantasy VII. The way that this single just drawing of a shot just added such a sense of place to everything. And going back to horror games, pre-rendered backgrounds were also used very masterfully there. The Resident Evil games are a prime example. The way that because you were stuck in a specific camera angle, it just added so much to the suspense and the horror. Honestly, I could probably make an entire video just talking about pre-rendered backgrounds, and I probably will do it. That sounds very, you know, internet pit stop core, but yeah. Like, look at this one from Chrono Cross. This shit is beautiful, this bridge, that boat just floating there, the blue water, the sky, the cloud. Oh, I love it here. I I want to live here. I do find it a shame that, you know, a lot of people just see this aesthetic as like a, ah, remember those old days? Man, we really thought that looked real. Geez, glad we're not using that anymore. <laughs> Instead of appreciating the things that did come from these aesthetics and the benefits that they had. And even though there are quite a few demakes and indie games that use this aesthetic, I would love to see more games in this style come about in cool, unique ways in the indie scene. I wanna see the style being used and preserved the exact same way that pixel art is today. Because much like pixel art, this style is also an aesthetic all on its own. But once again, I highly want to recommend you all check out and look for some artists that are doing this, especially on Instagram. Search hashtags like, I think it's like weird core, liminal space, and uh, dream core, because I know I'm not the only one that sees this shot of a 3D render of a Maru-chan that is just spinning and thinking like, that is so cool. <laughs> Which again, was made by the boy Vic Estrella. Check his stuff out, highly recommend him especially. And really cool of him, he actually made some art for me that you're gonna see now in our mid bumper. And I'll see y'all after that.
cel-shaded games like Wind Waker or Jet Set Radio are usually the games that come up during these discussions of stylized versus realistic graphics. And that makes sense as a lot of these cel-shaded games, even from the 2000s, age far better than their counterparts. That's not to say that these games' visuals can't be improved on. As you can see, I'm using the HD version of Wind Waker. But my point is that these styles age better. Wind Waker is a perfect example of that. Yes, the HD remake does look better, but if you compare it to the original, the improvement isn't this drastic overhaul of the game's look and aesthetics. Versus games that went for a more realistic route, when they're made to HD, they need to be completely redone. And apart from looking more timeless, the thing I really love about associated games is how they just bring this vibrancy and life to whatever style they're mimicking. The way color just pops on cell shading needs to be studied because this shit is beautiful. It's flat, it's vibrant, it's Ugh. It's probably why so many cell shaded games are so colorful. And on top of that, I feel like the cell shading look is just very adaptable to whatever style. It can be used to mimic a anime-esque style the way it did for the Afro Samurai game. Or look at the way it was used in the Sly Cooper games to embody that look of like a, just a Saturday morning cartoon. It also worked in capturing the comic book aesthetic for Ultimate Spider-Man. And don't get me wrong, I think the new Spider-Man games look good and their more realistic look, but for me, this is to me what I think Spider-Man games should go for aesthetically. Maybe I'm wrong for that, but I would have much preferred a newer Spider-Man game come out that just took this aesthetic but upped it. It was also used here in Okami to bring its Shinto painting art style to life. Just look at how these cherry blossom trees look or that beautiful colorful flower pattern trail that follows Okami. It's almost like you can see the individual brush strokes. The entire game looks like an actual Shinto painting. Mad World is still one of the most unique looking games out there. Having this very stark and limited black and white color palette, which is beautifully contrasted by the only other color you see of the red blood splatters. Again, thanks to cell shading, this game was able to take goriness and you know blood splatters and make them look more stylish than ever or something a bit later down the years with gravity rush holy shit the aesthetic of this game is still one of a kind its style was inspired by franco-belgian comics the creator toyama cites artists like uh robot voice lady jutsu <laughs> Jean Giraud and Denki Bilal. And choosing to have that style made with cell shading created something that was kind of a mix of realism and, you know, something more stylized, but ultimately made something wholly unique and forever memorable. And to this day, people are still talking about these beautiful blue waters of Wind Waker. When it comes to games that are known for their visual aesthetics and still talked about to this day, a lot of them are cell shaded games. Cell shading because it fits all these different aesthetics so well is just the perfect home for any game that's going for a more stylized approach. I mean, one of the first games ever to use cell shading, Jet Set Radio. While again, obviously it can be improved on which Jet Set Radio Future did do that. But when you start comparing it to other, you know, sports-ish type games from around the time that go for more realistic approaches, those do not age as well. But for Jet Set Radio and its sequel, these colors still pop, helped immensely by the black outlines of the characters. Jet Set Radio was going for a more manga character inspired aesthetic. It also had influences from hip hop culture and punk culture. And the city is a mix of Shibuya and New York Times Square and the South Bronx. And to me, I was always in fact with the way the nightlife looked in these games. The colorful neon lights blinking at all the little stores, all the cool decorations and projections. And once again, even with a game that has an aesthetic this unique that's blending hip hop and punk rock and fucking, you know, manga, it is able to flourish and look so fucking cool because of cell shading. Jet Set Radio might just be the embodiment of 
2000s cool. You know, it's Y2K, it's retro future, it's uh, the gorillas, extreme sports, uh, funky music, the colors, the aesthetic, the vibe, the fashion. And when I think back to how upon the release of Wind Waker that its style was very hated on because it was so cartoony and people wanted a more realistic Zelda, what they were expecting, what they wanted was this showcase here. And you look at that showcase of that more realistic Zelda that Nintendo showed to the crowd before Wind Waker, I think it all adds to why this aesthetic of Wind Waker is so memorable and still talked about today. But also, not just because the Zelda team was right for picking this aesthetic, but they were also ahead of their time, because if you look at Zelda games now that are wildly loved, like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, what do they look more like? Wind Waker. Modern Zelda games and a lot of stylized games to this day are still using cell shading and are still some of the most aesthetically pleasing games we got. I know I'm not the only one who was playing Tears of the Kingdom and would see a beautiful ass sunset and needed to take like a small little uh, cry at the beauty break. And the cell shading made these games legit look like Ghibli films. I have a huge respect and affinity for Arc Systems games because unlike a lot of other fighting games, they use cell shading to capture a more stylized look for their game. Sparking Zero looks hype as fuck, but aesthetically, man, I wish it looked more like Fighters, because Fighters, that to me is the best looking Dragon Ball Z game there is. Because the cell shading helped make this beautiful looking game that looks like a 90s anime in motion. And I do wish that a lot more fighting games would go for this look instead of the more realistic one. Don't get me wrong, I'm cool with like the new Street Fighter, but I wish I could see it done in a more cell shaded anime kind of look. And look, there's plenty of more examples to give. Nine times out of ten, if a modern game is going for something more stylized, it's gonna be done with cell shading. You look at the Game Award nominees for Best Art Direction, Almost all of them are games that are done with cell shading. It's a style that was ahead of its time and will continue to create timeless aesthetics throughout the industry. So I made this video not just to talk about, you know, cool older graphics, but also to be an addendum to this video that I made in the past. The script in this video was like one of my first couple scripts and I feel like I kind of got lost in like debating the whole realistic graphics versus stylized graphics and my point kind of got muddied and lost. There's always going to be a place for more realistic graphics. Graphics are always going to continue to improve and look more realistic. But that doesn't mean that we should only only see these older graphics as nothing but stepping stones, and instead see them as just another aesthetic, another art style that could be used in the right place. And not to say that these older styles don't have a home in the gaming landscape these days, I showed y'all plenty of examples, They're, yeah, they, they continue to exist for sure, but I still feel that there's this stigma in the industry towards graphics that aren't going for pure realism. Like I'm sorry, but Alan Wake winning best art director against all these heavily stylized games? That shit is highway robbery, are you kidding me? Again, not to say Alan Wake isn't a very beautiful, realistic looking game. It is, and it has its own unique art direction, but personality-wise, this? doesn't look that different from any other typical AAA game. And that's where I think my biggest problem lies when it comes to visual aesthetics and gaming. You go back to that like PS2 era, and you look at a game like SSX Tricky, right? Believe it or not, this game at the time was considered a AAA game. <laughs> because of the graphical limitations of the time, they couldn't rely on just raw graphical fidelity. You had to innovate, you had to be creative to elevate a game's visuals. Which is why it probably has this extremely stylish presentation. Just look at this character selection screen, this thing is full of personality. You compare this era's AAA games to current AAA games it's night and day. Yeah, sure, AAA games today look far more realistic than ever before, but aside from their individual art directions, I feel like AAA games don't really have as much personality anymore. They're all going for that same uh, realistic as possible look, as opposed to the AAA games of back then that couldn't rely on that and thus you have far more variety. 
And it does make sense that the AAA market would go in this direction. I mean, the whole meaning of AAA basically means like the safest investment for uh, the investors. And what is the most easiest, safest thing to sell to consumers and your investors? A game look pretty. There's always been this link between realism and advancement of tech. And because of that, especially now, whenever there's some new graphical thing that's happening in the market, whether it's ray tracing or, you know, whatever, AAA games need to start using it. Nowadays, AAA games don't just have the possibility of looking ultra realistic, they're expected to look that way. And not just by the industry, by fans too. I mean, think about all the controversies we've had in recent years, just about graphics. People will start a shitstorm over some puddles. And in a sense, I, I can't really blame them. I mean, don't get me wrong, this does piss me off. Like sincerely, uh, respectfully, uh, wholeheartedly, shut the fuck up. But again, graphics is what games are constantly marketing for. But I also feel like that's the reason we've lost this personality in AAA games. But even more crucially, the idea of having to constantly use the most up-to-date graphics and tech it creates many of the problems that are currently plaguing AAA games. For starters, when you have the expectation that all these AAA games need to have 4K texturing and real-time face body cam capture, we need to see every last detail from the butt hairs to the puddles don't fucking forget the puddles, all in the pursuit of capturing reality. It creates an environment where less AAA games are coming out because of this scope being higher than ever. I mean, the original Final Fantasy VII was considered a AAA game for its time, but only two years after, we got FF8. And then two years after that, we got FF9. Because that scope was much smaller, the turnaround for making those games was much faster. Now AAA games are taking far longer years to actually be finished and come out. And sometimes they're not even finished. I mean, with Final Fantasy VII Remake, we're waiting multiple years for parts of a game. <laughs> On top of that, because of these expectations of graphics, games cost more than ever to make now. And they cost more to buy too. On top of that, crunch time and overworking seems to be the worst it's been for the developers. Now, I'm not saying that this expectation that all the AAA games have to have graphical maximalism is the sole reason for all these problems, but it for sure is part of it. And maybe if we didn't just write off these older styles and different aesthetics as less than, that would immensely help not only making AAA games look way more unique than they do now, but also create an overall better, healthier industry. If you haven't figured it out yet, basically this whole video is just a stylish disguised way of saying this. <laughs> Just, it's, it's, it's just this take. It's just this. Obviously, I completely understand that there is a place for both realistic graphics and more stylized ones, but continuing to have this expectation of AAA games needing to use the most advanced, newest tech in order to capture realism and connecting realism to AAA is a continuingly huge problem because it instills this idea that the more real the graphics look, the more raw numbers are being put pushed, the better the game looks. Which plainly isn't true, there's so many of these stylized games that while yes have less of those graphics, are still better looking games. That idea strips away all other aspects that makes game visuals interesting. I hope we can get to a point where more stylized games aren't just expected to be indie or double a or whatever that even triple a games can be more stylized and don't have to be synonymous with realism like i'm not saying i want red dead 2 or last of us to be made with stylized graphics no i, I completely understand that some of these games work really well with realism but just that not every triple a game should be expected to go for that aesthetic because at the end of the day Graphics don't really matter that much, especially when the best-selling game looks like this. <laughs> Shout out Manly. Thank you as always for deciding to light your bonfire here on this corner of the internet. If you're new here and you like what you saw today, I'd really appreciate it if you gave your boy a like and a subscribe. Or if you want to support me the best way you can, you can do that as little as three beans here on my Patreon. And speaking of that Patreon, I actually have to introduce y'all 
to this. For a while now I've had it, so if you're at my highest tier on Patreon and you're there for three months, you get a pixel art character designed however you want. But I haven't had like a place for us to all chill at. But thanks to Holdsy, which you should follow on Twitter for doing this amazing artwork, they made me this beautiful background pit stop area for all my patrons to chill at. So if you also want to be a mad lad like these people and have a place here to chill at, you can do that on my Patreon. But with all that being said, thank you so much for coming to this little pit stop on the corner of the internet. Peace.